Hi everyone, my name is Ankit. Welcome to this video on how to conduct a fluid assessment. I've divided this video into two parts. In this first video, I'll be describing basic fluid physiology that I feel is important background knowledge when conducting a fluid assessment. In the second video, I'll describe how to conduct the fluid assessment itself. Just as a background to this video, I remember as an intern, I was asked to conduct a fluid review on a regular basis for a variety of reasons. In these two videos, my aim is to provide a foundation level knowledge to help guide fluid assessment in the clinical setting. The objectives of this first video are to understand fluid distribution in the human body and to describe factors that lead to shifts between fluid compartments. I'd like to emphasize that this video will provide a very basic understanding of fluid physiology. I would encourage further study in this area to gain a deeper understanding of this vast topic. I'll leave some links in the description below to other resources which you might find useful. The human body can be considered as a big bag of fluid. The total body volume is made up of two parts, the intravascular volume, which is everything contained within the circulatory system, such as the vein and arteries, and the extravascular volume, which is everything outside of these vessels. The extravascular volume is also known as the interstitium. The intravascular volume is particularly important, as it is responsible for perfusion of important organs such as brain and kidneys. If we were to take a blood sample from a vein and run it through a centrifuge, we would find that approximately 55% will be plasma and 45% will be red blood cells. The intravascular volume is separated from the extravascular volume by a semi-permeable membrane. This membrane is permeable to fluid and electrolytes but is not permeable to large molecules such as proteins. It is a plasma component of whole blood that is most active in fluid exchange with the extravascular space as it contains important electrolytes such as sodium and also contains proteins such as albumin. The red blood cell component does not play a significant role in fluid exchange. Normally there's an equilibrium that is maintained between the intra and extravascular spaces by the assistance of a few mechanisms. The first mechanism is hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is the pressure exerted by a fluid in a confined space. The blood contained within the vessels exerts a force against the semi-permeable walls, leading to the movement of fluid into the extravascular space. Oncotic pressure is a form of osmotic pressure exerted by proteins that usually tends to pull water into the circulatory system. In the human body, up to 80% of the total oncotic pressure is exerted by albumin. There are neurohormonal control mechanisms that also assist in fluid balance. I will not delve into these in depth, but just as a basic understanding, natriuretic peptides such as ANP and BNP lead to the loss of fluid uh, in situations of high intravascular volume. ADH helps retain water in the body, and activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system leads to fluid retention. Catecholamines such as adrenaline and noradrenaline can also play a significant role in fluid retention in cases of severe illness. Organ failures complicate the fluid balance situation. There are two situations where there may be increased hydrostatic pressure. In congestive cardiac failure, the pump in the, of the body, which is the heart, isn't able to move fluid around as efficiently as it was able to before. That leads to buildup of fluid in the intravascular space, leading to increased hydrostatic pressure and movement of fluid out into the extravascular space. A similar situation occurs in renal failure. In this situation, the filter of the body, the kidneys, isn't able to excrete fluid as efficiently and therefore that leads to, leads to a backup of fluid into the intravascular space, again leading to increased hydrostatic pressure and extravasation into the extravascular space. There are situations where there is decreased oncotic pressure. Examples of these include liver failure and also nephrotic syndrome. In both of these cases, there is a decreased net level of albumin, which means that the tendency of the circulatory system to hold water is reduced, and again, you, there is a loss and movement of fluid into the extravascular space. The neurohormonal response mechanisms that I mentioned earlier help to try and ameliorate the situation. However, in some situations, the neurohormonal mechanisms can actually make things worse. For example, in situations with congestive cardiac failure, let's say the pump is, is not functioning properly and there's a level of fluid retention. What the body will try to do is because it detects that the amount of intravascular volume and the perfusion to the organs is not as good as it was before, it will activate the renin adjutensid aldosterone system to retain even more fluid. This further fluid retention leads to a vicious cycle, 
where the pump, which is already failing, is asked to deal with even more fluid, creating a vicious cycle. Some of the medications that we use in heart failure, such as ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, help break this vicious, vicious cycle. There's another concept that I'd like to talk about, which is the idea of three, third spacing. In this diagram, I've res represented a situation where there is low intravascular volume, but high extravascular volume. Such a situation often comes about in, let's say, decompensated liver failure. In this situation, there are low levels of albumin, which means that there is a large fluid shift into the extravascular space from the intravascular volume. When we see these two kinds of patients, the clinical examination may reveal high total body volume. However, perfusion to the important organs is a function of the intravascular volume only. So even if the total body volume is high, there may be a depletion of effective circulatory volume, leading to decreased perfusion to the major organs. Fluid assessment is an attempt to ensure that the body is maintaining the correct fluid equilibrium in, by ensuring that the fluid is located in the right compartments and in the right ratio. That's all for this video. In the next video, I'll talk about conducting the fluid assessment itself.